For some time, I heard the name, seen pictures, heard about Pastor Wayne Hillsden. Last week, I got to know the man. Pastor Wayne has served in the Holy Land since 1983. He is the senior pastor of King of Kings Community, located in the heart of Jerusalem. Pastor Wayne has also served as academic dean of Israel College of the Bible and has helped mentor young leaders who have subsequently planted Hebrew-speaking congregations. In recent years, King of Kings Community has purchased and renovated a former movie theater in Jerusalem and transformed it into a worship and conference center called the Jerusalem Pavilion. More recently, they acquired the top floor of that same building, the 17th floor of that building, and transformed it into the Jerusalem Prayer Tower. It was an honor and privilege for me to be on a joint speaking engagement with Pastor Wayne just a few days ago in a conference in Regents University in Virginia called Emerged 21. Where there, I got to know the man, I got to know the friend, and I got to know my brother, Pastor Wayne. And I invite Pastor Wayne to come to stage and talk about the very important topic of the place of the Jewish people in God's purpose. Please welcome with me, Pastor Wayne. Good morning, it's great to be with you. I'm glad you mentioned that conference last week. That will explain my jet lag and uh, maybe inability to articulate just how I would like to. We're going to ask God for help. So, Lord, I thank you for this opportunity. I pray the ability to speak as you speak, that I would have a listening ear and be able to proclaim a truth. And I thank you for each listener. Give us anointed ears to hear what the Spirit would say to us. In Jesus' name, in Yeshua's name, amen. Um, I have a unique privilege pastoring in Jerusalem uh, to have actually the directors, the executive directors of three Zionist organizations, the International Christian Embassy, Christian Friends of Israel, and Bridges for Peace, and also to have the directors of three ministries that are involved uh, almost exclusively in Palestinian outreach. Uh, in fact, uh, Salim Munayer, I hope you don't mind me telling this, but uh, attends the Hebrew uh, stream of our congregation under the leadership of uh, an Israeli Jewish pastor named Oded Shoshani. And uh, so it is unique, and uh, I, I love uh, you. I love everyone that's involved on both sides of the divide, and I believe that, uh, that God can call us to unique uh, tasks. As we look in the book of uh, of, of Galatians, where Paul was called to the circumcision and the pillars uh, the Jewish pillars in Jerusalem were called to the circumcision, and there was a, a distinct and unique calling on each of these individuals. So God has called us uniquely. I want to share with you this morning the subject, as you've already heard, the place of the Jewish people in God's purposes. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, the Apostle Paul speaks of the people of Israel, the Jewish people, and their story in verse 6 saying, Now these became our examples. Now, that's the past, but this morning I want to show you that Israel is not only a period piece hanging on a museum wall, uh, but the Jewish people continue to serve as a moving picture, a living parable. And it's not just about the past or the present, but it's also even about the future. And throughout the ages, this picture has been seen. It's been recognized, many times celebrated, at other times discarded. Even the early church fathers recognized this picture. I think of Origen, who lived in 185 to 254 AD, wrote in his commentary to the, on the epistle to Romans, 
He says the people of Israel are still missing from the complete picture. But when the fullness of the Gentiles has come in and Israel comes to salvation at the end of time, then it will be the people which, although it existed long ago, will come at the last and complete the fullness of the Lord's portion and inheritance. Earlier, Justin Martyr, who lived in 103 to 165 AD, understood that the tribes of Israel would be gathered and restored in accord with what the prophet Zechariah predicted. And he writes, And what the people of the Jews shall say and do when they see him coming in glory has been thus predicted by Zechariah the prophet. I will command the four winds to gather the scattered children. I will command the north wind to bring them and the south wind and it keep them not back. And then in Jerusalem, there shall be a great lamentation, not the lamentation of mouths or of lips, but the lamentation of the heart. And they shall rend not their garments, but their hearts. Tribe by tribe, they shall mourn, and they shall look on him whom they have pierced. And they shall say, why, O Lord, hast thou made us to err from thy way? The glory which our fathers blessed has for us been turned into shame. So it seems that Those early church fathers saw some kind of literal restoration of the Jewish people in the end times. Many reformed theologians had a clear picture of a continuing, moving picture of Israel, a storyline that will continue to unfold into the end. John Calvin, Charles Hodge, John Murray, just to name a few, and they certainly weren't dispensationalists, acknowledged that at least in the end days leading up to the coming of the Lord, the Jewish people are destined for restoration. Charles Wesley wrote a hymn about this picture, describing God's summons to his people, Israel, to return to their homeland and to their God. You can look it up. It's called Almighty God of Love. A century ago, even more than a century ago, this picture was being viewed with fascination in churches, in uh, institutions of higher learning, across the denominational spectrum. The early Zionist movement was propelled not by fringe elements and only the pre- uh, or the um, dispensationalists or Christian Zionists. Hosts of Christian leaders and statesmen saw this picture emerging from the History Museum archives and coming into focus and attention again. And today around the world, new believers are coming into the kingdom, hungrily reading their Bibles, and without Darby's help and without the help of the Schofield Bible, are reading those scriptures according to its face value, according to common sense, and arriving at a conclusion that God seems to have some special role for the Jewish people, has been in the past, is in the present, and will be again in the future. Hundreds, probably thousands of former Muslims, and I've met many of them, who have come to know Jesus as Messiah and Savior and have suddenly got a love for Jewish people. It's remarkable. And they look at the scriptures and they see that God has some kind of special, unique plan for this people. In Asia, Africa, South America, fresh believers are simply reading the scriptures and coming to this conclusion. Without the aid of erudite scholars and Bible commentators, they don't see the Jewish people buried under the rubble of archaeological tells. They see the Jewish people still alive. Many of the reformers like Luther encouraged everyday people to read the Bible at face value rather than depend upon that exclusive group of priests who interpreted the scriptures for the layman. And so the layman were released to read and and through the illumination of the Holy Spirit come to their own conclusions. Maybe I could just have some water. Someone had, Can I borrow that one? So more and more people today, as they read their scriptures, especially new believers, have come to see some kind of literal fulfillment of ancient prophecies. They see how it was predicted by Micah that Jesus would be born in a town called Bethlehem, and he really was. And uh, he was literally exiled into 
Egypt and returned to Judea as a fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. There are details concerning his death and his resurrection that we read in Isaiah 53 and other texts, and even the minutest details, even how his garments were to be divided and the exact price of his betrayal. And likewise, the common reader can see prophecies that are not yet fulfilled from the Old Testament as likely will be fulfilled in some kind of literal fashion. And the psalmist writes in Psalm 19 regarding the scriptures that God's word makes wise the simple, that somehow even children, teenagers, can read the text and somehow understand what's written without great sophistication, without the aid of big libraries and Google. Most of the rest of what I want to do this morning, and I don't have much time, and I know we started later, and uh, I don't have much time. Let me just read some of the text of scriptures, and, and let's just pray that the Holy Spirit illumine our minds. So, Lord, I ask you for supernatural ability to understand what you're saying in your word, Lord. Uh, and I just pray that the reading of your word will be a blessing to each and every one of us. In Jesus' name. Time to time, I'll make little comments, but I don't think um, I'll sway your views in any way, but mostly just the reading of the text. Uh, Gary Burge, uh, I, you did a wonderful job, and your your view of, um, you called it messianic fulfillment. I, I think I'm with you there. I want to talk to you more about that later, but I think I'm with you on that. Uh, and you already mentioned the scripture, uh, the calling of Abram, uh, Avram, Abram, in, uh, in Genesis chapter 12, I'll just read the, the third verse where it says, I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So what's the place or purpose of the Jewish people in God's purposes? One is to bring blessing, not just to the Jewish people, but to be a blessing to all the families of the earth. While Abraham is the father of both Isaac and Ishmael, the promise of his seed being a blessing to the entire world was not given to Ishmael, but to Isaac and his offspring. We read in Genesis 26, verse 1 and following, And Isaac went to Abimelech, king of the Philistines and Gerar. Then the Lord appeared to him and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Live in the land which I shall tell you. Dwell in this land, and I will be with you and bless you. For to you and your descendants I will give all these lands, and I will perform the oath which I swore to Abraham your father, and I will make your descendants multiply as the stars of heaven. I will give to you, your descendants, all these lands, and in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed." Genesis 28, we read, concerning Jacob, the son of Isaac. G Genesis 28, verse 3 and following, May God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and multiply you, that you may be an assembly of, of peoples and give you the blessing of Abraham to you and your descendants with you, that you may inherit the land in which you are a stranger, which God gave to Abraham. And then we read in Genesis 28, again, concerning Jacob, Verse 13 and following, And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie I will give to you and your descendants. Also your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth. You shall spread abroad to the west and the east, to the north and the south, and in you and in your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And we know that the uh, the ultimate blessing for all the nations, all the families of the earth, will be in that single seed, which is Jesus, which is Yeshua. And we read in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 14, where it says, For it is evident that our Lord arose from Judah. And so from Jacob, his son Judah, a new line begins, and ultimately the Messiah will come from that line, and he will be the king over the nation. Yehuda, Judah, the son of Jacob, is the from where we get the word Yehudi or Jew. Yehuda, Yehudi. Concerning the tribe of Yehuda or Judah, we read in Genesis 49 and following, and I'll just read verse 10 
as we have little time, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh comes, and to him shall be the obedience of the people. Most distinguished rabbis say that Shiloh or Shiloh here is the Messiah who will come from the tribe of Judah. So we see how the Jewish people who are the direct descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Judah have a unique special place in the eternal purposes of God. Indeed, through them and their seed, and ultimately through Jesus, son of David, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Number two, the Jewish people bless us by being agents or ambassadors of the gospel or the good news of salvation. And so we read this in John chapter 4, verse 22. Jesus saying to the Samaritan woman, you worship what you do not know. We know what we worship for salvation is of, depending on your text, your uh, translation, salvation is from the Jews or of the Jews. It means the same thing. And Paul writes in Romans chapter 3, verses 1 to 3, what advantage then has the Jew or what is the profit of circumcision? Much in every way, chiefly because to them, that is to the Jews, were committed the oracles of God. For what if some did not believe? Will their unbelief make the faithfulness of God without effect? And so the Jewish people have a special role in God's purposes because the oracles of God, the very revelation of salvation, was given to them, and they were to be the ones who were to send that message to all the families of the earth. The Jewish people have been given great privilege, and Paul says this in Romans chapter 9, verses 2 and following. I have great sorrow and continual grief in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were accursed from the Messiah, from Christ, for my brethren, my countrymen, according to the flesh, who are, not were, but who are Israelites, to whom pertain the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God, and the promises, of whom are the fathers and from whom, according to the flesh, Christ came, who is over all the eternally blessed God. Amen. So far we see in the scriptures that I've read that we see that the Jewish people have a special place in God's purposes as a means of bringing blessing to all the families of the earth and that they are given the oracles of God to reveal God's salvation plan, not just to them, but to all the families of the earth. In other places, this salvific role that the Jewish people have is spoken of as their role as a light to the nations. In other words, the Jews were uniquely called to be God's missionaries to the nations of the earth, to bring revelation to a dark world and bring people into the kingdom of God's pure light. Now, before I move to my next point, Paul makes it clear that even though in his day only a remnant of fellow Jews put their trust in their Jewish Messiah, we should not be anti-Semitic and wish for their harm. Rather, the opposite. In light of the fact that they have the oracles and they're the ones who brought us the message of salvation, we should be careful. He says in Romans 11, 17 and following, and if some of the branches were broken off and you being a wild olive tree were grafted in among them, not in place of them, but among them and with them became a partaker of the root and the fatness of the olive tree, do not boast against the branches. And here he's talking about Jews still in unbelief. Don't boast against the branches, but if you do boast, remember that you do not support the root, but the root supports you. And not only should we not think of ourselves better than the Jews and despise them for their unbelief, but Paul says this in Romans 15, verse 27. It pleased them indeed. He's talking about those who were uh, ra uh, raising an offering for the saints in Jerusalem. He said, it pleased them indeed, and they are their debtors. For if the Gentiles have been partakers of their spiritual things, their duty is also to minister to them in material things. So not only should we not be anti-Semitic, but we should wish for and even help in the material needs of Jewish people because we are debtors to them for what they have given to us. I now come to a third role of the Jewish people in God's purposes. 
Israel is not only a vivid picture of blessing and a light of salvation, but negatively, Israel is also a warning light. Israel's serial unfaithfulness to their God and Savior results in harsh judgment. But as we will see later, that it is not judgment for the sake of Israel's wholesale destruction, but Israel's restoration. The Jewish people serve as a warning of what can happen when you commit spiritual adultery. Even before the Jewish people had committed this sin, God warns that such judgment or discipline will happen. Deuteronomy 29, verse 14 and following, But if you do not obey me and do not observe all these commandments, and if you despise my statutes, or if your soul abhors my judgments so that you do not perform all my commandments, but break my covenant, and we know that that's a marriage covenant from other texts of Scripture, this is what will happen, verses 32 and 33. I will bring the land to desolation, and your enemies who dwell in it shall be astonished at it. I will scatter you among the nations and draw out a sword after you. Your land shall be desolate and your cities waste. So this is a warning. This is a warning light. Not just a light of revelation, but this is a warning light. Paul writes to Gentile Christians that you should be warned, too. If this happened to the Jewish people, it can happen to you. And he says this in verses 19 and following of Romans 11. You will say, say then, branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well said. Because of unbelief, they were broken off, and you stand by faith. Do not be haughty, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he may not spare you either. Therefore, consider the goodness and severity of God on those who fell, severity, but toward you, goodness. If you continue in his goodness, otherwise, you also will be cut off. You also will be cut off. Fourthly, we know that God didn't choose the Jewish people just to be a sermon illustration of the blessings that can come or the curses that will come because of spiritual adultery. He also chose them because of a heart of love for them, not because they were any better than other people, any greater than other people. Actually, they were the fewest and smallest of the peoples of the earth. God's heart is a heart of love, and he loved them in spite of them. And is anyone else in this room thankful that he loves you in spite of you? I'm thankful he loves me in spite of me. In Jeremiah 31, 33, God says concerning the Jewish people that I was a husband to them. So that's the relationship. It's a covenant of marriage. Malachi 1, 2, it says, I have loved you, says the Lord. And he says specifically at the end of that verse, Jacob, I have loved very specific, Israel, I have loved. You might say that's not fair. God has a special love for Jacob, for Israel. Well, let's put this into perspective. To whom much is given, even much more is required. To the degree that Israel has been loved and privileged to have that special love relationship with her husband, the God of Israel, having been given the oracles of God, so Israel will also be held especially responsible for the unique calling and gifts that they have been given. God, uh, Paul explains that the seeming unbalanced love toward the Jewish people and their privileges is evened out and made fair and just in the way that God demands of his beloved people an even higher standard of obedience and example to the, to the other nations. Romans 2, uh, verse 6 and following, who will render it to each one according to his deeds? Eternal life to those who by patient continuance and doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality. But to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath. Now listen to this, verse 9. Tribulation and anguish on every soul of man who does evil. Of the Jew first, and also of the Greek. But glory, honor, and peace to everyone who works what is good, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. For there is no partiality with God. Israel's uniquely loved, and Israel's uniquely held to account for the privileges she's been given. 
This awful responsibility of having been loved and chosen in this way has often made the Jewish people wish they were never chosen in the first place. If you ever saw uh, Tevye, uh, Fiddler on the Roof and what Tevia said in that movie, in that play, he said, I know we are the chosen people, but once in a while, can't you choose someone else? So the Jewish people paint for us how deep God's love is, but how extremely high is his expectation of those he loves. Now, the picture is incomplete. I don't know how many in this room are painters, but isn't it an awful thing when you're in the middle of a painting and they, someone comes and looks over your shoulder and then looks at your painting and say, what's that? And, and, and the picture of Israel and the Jewish people can look pretty messy right now as we're looking at the present state of this nation. But the picture is not complete yet. And how awful it would be that someone com comes along and you're painting and you've spent hours on this painting and someone takes a palette knife or a brush and smudges or changes the image that you've been painting. And yet there are many people that are trying to do that today in relation to this nation. The artist calmly says, it is not finished. Hold on. And God is not finished with the Jewish people. There is a picture of a hope and a future, and it's not only for Israel. Uh, it is also for the sons of Ishmael. And, and there's a beautiful picture of that in Isaiah chapter 19, where it says this, Verse 23, in that day there will be a highway from Egypt to Assyria, and Assyria will come into Egypt, and Egypt into Assyria, and the Egyptians will worship with the Assyrians. In that day Israel will be the third with Egypt and Assyria, a blessing in the midst of the earth, whom the Lord of hosts has blessed, saying, Blessed be Egypt, my people, and Assyria, the work of my hands, and Israel, my inheritance." And so Israel has some kind of role in this end time finishing of the picture of God's purposes for the whole human, human race, all the families of the earth. And the last thing I want to share with you is the fact that because God is a covenant lover, that he is the husband and he hates divorce and he is fully committed to his wife, his bride that no matter how far away the Jewish people have wandered and have been in exile and profaned his holy name, his love is persistent. I want to read Ezekiel 36. I don't know how far I'll get. and You can cut me off if I'm going too long. I've lost track. How many minutes have I gone? How many? I got five minutes left? Four minutes left. Okay, I'm going to skip right down to verse 24. Actually, I'll go to verse 20, Ezekiel 36. When they came to the nations, speaking of the Jewish people, wherever they went, they profaned my holy name when they said of them, these are the people of the Lord, and yet they have gone out of his land. But I had concern for my holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the nations wherever they went. Therefore say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, I do not do this for your sake, O house of Israel. I do not do this for your sake, O house of Israel. It's not about you. It's about me. He goes on to say, but for my holy name's sake which you have profaned among the nations wherever you went. And I will sanctify my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned in their midst. And the nations shall know that I am the Lord, says the Lord, when I am hallowed in you before their eyes. For I will take you from among the nations, gather you of, out of all countries, and bring you into your own land. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will keep my judgment judgments and do them. Something is going to happen in these end times, if we're in the end times, even 
The early apostles believed they were in the end times, so I think it's fair to say that. We're closer and closer to the end. Something will happen. And this is where many of us get tripped up, and it's, it's hard to fathom and understand. But according to Ezekiel 36 and 37, which, of course, you know, is the vision of the dry bones and the coming together physically of bones rattling together, sinews, flesh, skin coming upon those bones, a physical restoration of a national body, it appears to me, that it appears in Ezekiel 36, in, verse, in, 30, in 20, 36, 37, and in other portions of Ezekiel, that the first thing to happen before Israel's spiritual restoration, most Jewish people will come to faith, it appears, from those texts, after they have come into the land. It would appear that they have a doctor's appointment. They are going to meet their heart surgeon in the land. It is here before they have earned the right to be here. That this loving, covenant-keeping husband will allure her into the land, and he will, of his own volition, taking his own initiative, he will do a heart transplant. There will be a spiritual restoration of his people as well. Paul says in Romans chapter 11, verse 25 and 26, I don't want you to be uh, unaware of this mystery, my brothers, that uh, Israel is blind in part. When the fullness of the Gentiles comes in, then all Israel shall be saved. Almost all of the Reformed commentators and scholars that I have read take verses 26 to 29 of, that, of Romans chapter 11 and cannot get around the fact that it appears that the Jewish people will, once, will again appear on, on the stage of history and that God will bring some kind of spiritual restoration to his people as well. And even looking at verse 15, where it says, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? Most of the biblical scholars I've read, including Reformed scholars, say that that's a resuscitation. It's a spiritual resurrection. It's not the same Greek word that you use for the resurrection of the body, but it's some kind of spiritual resuscitation. It's going to be revival to the nations. Somehow Jewish people being grafted back into their own olive tree. Through faith and through the power of the Holy Spirit is going to be a tonic to the nations in the same way that we are to provoke Israel to jealousy. Verse 11 of that passage, in the same way when Israel begins to come in back into their tree, it's going to also provoke the Gentiles to jealousy. And there's going to be some kind of symbiotic, uh, tonic relationship one with another. And we are going to see some kind of end time revival and restoration. And in truly, the, those texts that prophesy some kind of blessing to all the families of the earth will indeed happen. Now, hope for the future. Sammy and I spoke on the same stage last week in Regent University, and I presented a dream that I have. A dream is this. It's an Ephesians 2 dream. But the way that the world will be able to get hope in this land of, of conflict and where there is so little peace and love, that we will be able to create microcosms of the kingdom that will look a lot like Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47. But it will not be just Jews this time, but it will be all peoples who have come to faith in the seed of Abraham, in Jesus, their Messiah, will be able to come together with Jesus in the center. A peace that will come not through negotiations around a table and a sig signatures on some agreement, which so often get broken, but rather the sealed in his blood, signed in his blood. The work of the cross will break down the wall of partition, the wall of enmity between Jew and Gentile. And we will have what, I, what Paul says is a one new man. Jesus prophesied that the day would come that he has other sheep 
that he wants to bring into his fold. He's, he came to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, but he said, I've got some other sheep I want, want brought in. And ultimately, there's going to be one fold and one shepherd. And it's going to be Jew and Arab together. Why not now? Why not as we pray so often, thy kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I'm an optimist about the future. I believe that we can already now create communities of believers where Arab and Jew together worship and serve the living God under the banner of Jesus, Messiah, King. And I'm going to do my part to make that happen. I'm thankful that increasingly our staff, uh, is we're adding Palestinian believers to our team, our school of media, a third to a half of our students over the past three years have been Palestinian Christians. And I have friends that have the same vision as me. Some are Jewish and some are Arab. And I want to see those microcosms of the kingdom established so that the gospel will not just be heard, but will be seen. The gospel will be proven to be not just a theory, but it works. And Jesus will get all the glory. And God's name will be sanctified. And all the families of the earth shall be blessed. God bless you. Thank you for letting me share.